Hi everybody, my name is Theo. I'm the governance working steward at VitaDAO. Um, we've been around for a year pretty much exactly. We are just now um, celebrating our anniversary. And <clears throat> I would like to really share today some in-depth looks look at this um, sort of DSIDAO. Um, so diving into the operations and, and the details how we work, um, present some challenges we faced and some lessons learned and really conclude with um, a call to action to, to use these experiences that DSI and Impact DAOs make uh, these days and, and help new ones emerge and learn from you know, previous mistakes made. So first, um, about VitaDAO really briefly, so that you understand the context. VitaDAO is really um, a, a collective of, of individuals funding longevity research. And um, yeah, what is new, of course, is the community aspect and the token-rated governance. And um, how this really works um, in, the, in the ecosystem context is that our DAO members, our community members at the top, they hold VITA governance tokens, which entitle them to um, really decide what the organization it does. Um, the organization then um, collaborates with labs um, at universities and, and in private industry around the world to conduct research on behalf of VitaDAO. And usually there is an IP NFT involved, which is the, the technical mechanism for VitaDAO as an on-chain entity to, to capture and own the IP involved because VitaDAO is currently not registered anywhere in a legal entity. This um, IP NFT concept has been explained by, Jam by James earlier today. Um, shout out to James. So um, I would really recommend you to watch that talk this morning or um, check it out on YouTube. Um, I assume it will be uploaded. Um, really briefly for the context of this um, talk, I'll just say that um, the IP NFT framework is um, really this mechanism for this on-chain entity like VitaDAO to make use um, of IP. And it combines a really clever combination of layers, including um, a, a data storage and an encrypted storage with federated access control for the owner of the IP NFT to access it, um, and also some, some legal framework that allows the on-chain entity, even without having a legal entity, um, to make use of, of the IP, um, of, of, the sec of the protection. So um, how we operate financially um, is that we raised funds initially by auctioning off the Vita governance token. That was done through a fair auction, which means um, anyone could place a bid on an amount of tokens. And in the end um, of the batch, anyone was paying the same price. So if you bid a lot, um, you, would all, you would even end up paying less than that. And you would pay the minimum amount that, was, um, that passed the threshold. Um, and, and that is what's, what is considered a fair launch. There was also no pre-sale involved with venture capital organizations or either pre-allocations and we we believe we had a clean start with this community launch and then from there took it with proposals to the community um, that would then decide which budgets would be allocated to which working groups and um, now we use these funds to to fund longevity research of course um, we'll have We'll probably have for the raises in the future. We're also currently working on a on a, a strategic race with con with uh, strategic contributors that will be announced soon. And um, in the medium to longer term, of course, the idea is that the IP NFTs that the DAO holds will return revenue in any of these ways. So that could involve licensing, that could could set, could include a sale of of IP and other formats. So um, why crypto and longevity? What, does, what makes this niche of longevity research really appealing? And what, um, what was the reason for VitaDAO really to, to, ex to, to be come into place? And um, what's interesting here is the parallel between um, crypto 
as this new um, means of um, inside finance as opposed to traditional finance. Uh, when longevity is uh, really seen as this niche in, in health and pharma that um, is arguably not getting enough attention and, and underrated. So th they are both having, both, both fields are having this sort of um, outlier um, characterization. And um, on top of that, um, what's also really interesting here is the third point that a lot of crypto OGs, a lot of crypto community members uh, appear to be personally interested in, in longevity. So, um, and, th and then of course um, we have the fact that um, a lot of um, existing systems across the world, health systems and how the um, pharma businesses operate, they are usually designed around incentive systems and mechanisms that um, prefer treating disease over, over preventing disease. And aging, um, funding research on aging and, and providing products and services around um, aging is, is usually complicated to achieve through these existing systems. Nevertheless, of course, there is a high demand. There is a lot of interest among individuals and researchers, which is why VitaDAO really filled this gap. And in this way, uh, the longevity niche out of all possible decentralized science applications was really sort of a low-hanging fruit to get started, to validate the concept of a decentralized science DAO. And yeah, I'm going to come back later to some best practices for hopefully many, many other DSI DAOs to emerge. So about DSI, um, I'm sure you've heard the term a lot of times before today, and I'm probably not the first one defining this, but I just want to make sure we are on the same page here. So, um, and this is also, I should say, just my own take. I don't think there is a um, commonly accepted definition of DSI yet, which is also a really good point because um, there is a lot of debate on what DSI is, what it should be. And my take is really, um, there are these two perspectives. So the first one um, really coined by communities like Blockchain for Science and, and other Others um, sees decentralized science um, to care about the scientific method. So it's sort of a continuation of the op open science movement, specifically leveraging decentralized technologies like blockchain um, for the purpose of, well, advancing the scientific method like publishing and reputation systems. Um, and then the other perspective is much more focused on the application layer, like VitaDAO, um, is looking specifically at, at longevity research applications or other emerging DAOs looking at rare diseases. Um, they would um, really apply uh, research and make use of decentralized technologies to um, provide goods and services, to have some sort of fundraising involved, some coordination mechanisms that are decentralized, some distribution mechanisms. So, um, of course, there's also the intersection, uh, the overlap of both, and the, um, um, so, so these I could also be both, but I'm curious to see um, what really turns out to be the major um, focus of DSI in a few years. So, how we work at VitaDAO is, firstly, um, we have a three-phase process. Discord is really the, the core part. Um, you, you're probably aware of it, it's, it's a chat app um, on desktop and mobile. And um, that is usually um, not too complicated. People are used to it, even though it is yet another tool you, you would have to use. And then similarly, and, and this is also where we have all our working groups um, communicating. They are usually open, at least read access is available to everyone, except for some sensitive channels like legal. And then we continue the, the conversation on a discourse forum where we also have some sort of soft governance um, involved. And yeah, that is also quite, quite standard. And then the slightly more complicated part is, is perhaps snapshot where you need your, um, your, your own wallet. You need to connect MetaMask where you have your Vita, Vita governance tokens where you then vote on proposals which have previously gone through Discord and discourse and are then eventually um, voted on on snapshot through a token weighted vote. Um, so 
um, this three-step process, I believe, is really um, a good compromise for today, I would say. So personally, I'm really not a fan of token-rated voting, even though it is probably the best thing we currently have that really works in practice. I know there is a lot of research going on here around alternatives, and I'm also really curious about many of these concepts. However, currently, we are still using token-rated voting in the last phase, but we complement that in the second phase with sort of a one-person, one-vote um, decision on Discord with a focus on the qualitative conversation, comments, and feedback that is incorporated in the second phase. And in the first phase, initially, very importantly, um, we have a longevity research group, a working group, um, evaluating proposals, uh, and they are, um, of course, highly qualified. They have credentials, they have other other means of, of proving their expertise. Anyone can apply, but there is some sort of selection mechanism which was re really results in the fact that the first phase comes up with a proposal that is usually of extremely high quality. And then in the in the next second phase it would be it could be refined slightly and in, in the third phase it is just a binary yes no vote. So ultimately yes token holders have the say but it is really the yes no vote to this um, extensive work that has been done previously in the first phase by by PhDs and experts in the longevity working group. And these, this is just a list of um, proposals we have already funded and um, currently there is one in phase three voting and a couple of more uh, proposals in phase two being discussed and I would encourage everyone to check out the um, discourse governance forum at gov.vitalau.com. Um, but yeah, let me come um, really to the point of this conversation and um, the conversation I would like to initiate to is the challenges we faced and the lessons learned we believe we have, but really more so which open questions there are still. So um, first, onboarding. And this is really a huge challenge to, to many DAOs, and especially, I believe, in the DeSci space, when the target audience is really usually not crypto savvy uh, or Web3 native, or how you would call that. Um, so what really helped uh, here is, is, first of all, having a clear system of knowing who you need, because um, if it turns out that your DAO um, becomes somewhat popular, you get a lot of interested people and you, ideally you would take all of them but you need to coordinate that and, and just have have a system of what is currently needed so that requires of course the DAO to be aware um, of the strategy it has perhaps using an OKR system and then also translating that into some sort of a bounty board or a, or a place where you collect open tasks so you can easily match um, applications with open roles or tasks and that is best done through a team that is really solely responsible for onboarding. Um, of course, you also need extensive documentation, and that is probably uh, goes without saying, but um, it doesn't write itself, and no one really likes doing it. So, so it's really important to point out, and we are using a one-stop shop in, in a Notion website. Um, I also noticed that it's really important to reach out to the um, less loud voices, make sure the introverts um, are heard and, and really include their expertise. Yeah, and then the second big point here is um, that, of course, a DAO aspires to be flat and fluid, but it also needs to be productive and efficient. And that's a really hard balance to strike. Um, so we are using a core team for efficiency, um, and we have some checks and balances involved, some governance mechanisms, some reoccurring road, but that, that always needs to be improved more. So I believe you should have uh, individuals and core teams, but always make sure that the governance, that the context, the underlying governance makes sure that there are um, no silos emerging or no permanent positions and that the DAO community really has a say and has an effective say about um, the, um, who takes these core roles. And then second big point would be about culture and really this um, remote first setting when most DAOs are usually exclusively working online um, 
having never been in an office because obviously it helps a lot when you have at least a kickoff workshop in person and then you work online for a year. That is even much better than starting off online and never meeting in person. So when meeting in, when meeting in person is possible, you should totally do that. And we're doing that at offsites around conferences, for example. But if not, of course, one-on-ones are really important and usually not done as often as they should. And then we're also using tools like Gather Town um, or just some casual um, um, online video calls to try to at least have some casual conversations. Um, yeah, and then another big point is resolving conflicts. Um, yeah, we realized um, you need to expect them to happen at some point, and you better have at least some sort of process in place or someone who's, who's qualified to, to help out with these, to mediate. Um, and um, whatever you do, how, no matter how, more, how formal or, or less formal you, 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 do, you do that, you do need some sort of process because if you have nothing in place, it just takes up all the energy and time of the core team and um, could even end up destroying the DAO. And then um, the two last points I'd like to make is firstly about the tokenomics dimension of um, involving contributors with beta governance tokens for voting, with um, stable coins as payouts, with tokens as payouts and rewards or bounties. And all of that, of course, um, it requires you know new people being onboarded to Web3, explaining what a private key is, how to manage that securely, um, not to fall for scams, which frequently occur in our Discord or Telegram. So that's a really tricky one. And also, we recently had an incident where someone sent USDC to Coinbase, um, and apparently it got lost, even though they used the official um, account given on, on Coinbase. That was not, not cleared out yet. It's in the process. But there are so many details that could go wrong and overwhelm a contributor, when really the point is we should make use of everyone's knowledge, and the technology should be enabling. It should not really be a barrier, but it of course often is. So while while the UX is still not great, um, provide extensive information and step-by-step -step guides and just really take the time to talk one-on-one -on -one on, with anyone who has questions. And, and last but not least, um, also the coordination processes, the governance, um, which includes voting um, and on-chain voting, of course. So we started out with a, a Moloch DAO adaptation on mainnet with uh, $50 of gas fees for each single vote at times. And of course, we realized that is really not practical. It may work in some, you know, collect the DAOs where some crypto OGs collect NFTs and have bags of ether and don't care about gas, but it surely does not work for the usual DSI DAO and it would discriminate against a lot of um, high potential individuals. So you really need to not see the technology as a given, but also in incorporate the, the needs of your community and find some middle ground. And I'm a strong believer in the idea of um, um, incremental decentralization. So working towards the goal of becoming perf perfectly decentralized eventually. But while the UX is still a major downside, um, do compromise, and in our case, we are using Snapshot, which is somewhat secure, but it's e super easy to use. It's, it's free to use. You use your governance tokens to just sign a message instead of paying for a transaction. So that's just one example we're taking for the a specific example we're doing in the, in, this, in the short term. But in the long term, uh, and that's also a conversation I would like to, love to have afterwards, is the step-by-step -step process over the next years. How do you start out as a DAO that uh, makes sure that contributors can effectively participate? Um, so what tools are specifically uh, appropriate for that? And then also have this roadmap and timeline in mind. Where do, where do we want to be in a couple of years to be really decentralized, and what are the preparations we should do today. So yeah, that's really my call to this um, whole room, and would love to continue the conversation on the hall after the next talk, because that's Niklas from LabDAO, which you shouldn't miss either. So really to work, let us all work on templates for new DSIDOs to emerge, like um, VitaDAO, 
been around for a year, lab now just drawing up now, Psyda are emerging soon, and really let us share this knowledge um, to provide newcomers um, with templates on governance and economics so that these newcomers can focus on the science. Thanks very much.